Welcome, welcome, welcome to tonight's Wu University event, um, Upgrading Your Myopia Management Practice, Soft Contact Lens Modalities and Fee Structure with Dr. Andrew Newkirk. Welcome, I am your host, Dr. Jennifer Stewart. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Newkirk. He received his doctorate of optometry from Indiana University in 2008. In 2014, he was a recipient of the Vision Monday Optometric Business Innovator Award and was a recipient of the 2017 Illinois Optometric Association Young Optometrist of the Year Award. He frequently travels and lectures on the topics of contact lenses and practice management and has been published in a number of optometric journals. He's the leading provider for myopia management treatment in the North Shore of Chicago and is the leading prescribing MySight optometrist in the United States. Welcome, Dr. Newkirk. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So just a couple of my financial disclosures. I am a um, key opinion leader for, to, uh, for Topcon Healthcare and also for Cooper Vision Specialty Eye Care. And all financial relationships have been mitigated. If you have any questions at the end of this lecture, uh, please feel free to send me an email. That is my personal email address at, on the screen right there. And we'll share that again towards the end of the lecture as well too. Um, so let's talk about upgrading your myopia management practice uh, specifically as it pertains to soft contact lens modalities. And we will also talk about the fee structures that so many people are so interested in and trying to figure out how to set up in their practices. So just a little background on me. So why the heck am I in front of you talking about this here? Uh, so I practice in Carolyn, at Carolyn Vision Care. This is a practice in the North suburbs of Chicago. Uh, this was a very old private practice that I bought when it was over 50 years old at the time. Um, this was 2011 when I came on, uh, grew the practice quite a bit. Uh, and then in uh, late uh, 2021, almost two years ago now, we did uh, successfully partner with a private equity group with Acuity Eye Care Group, also known as AEG. Um, and I can firsthand tell you that myopia management uh, does fit very well in not only the private practice setting, but in the employed optometrist setting as well too. I am still seeing patients four days a week uh, while being employed at AEG, um, Carillon Vision Care. Uh, we currently have over 350 kids that are presently enrolled in our myopia management program. Uh, this represents over $500,000, a half a million dollars per year in annual revenue coming into our practice. You know, we're only about a 1.7 full-time equivalent practice, so pretty big number. Um, and uh, as uh, Dr. Stewart mentioned, I am proud to be the top prescribing uh, my site optometrist in the United States. I got my start um, with myopia management with uh, orthokeratology a little over 10 years now, approaching 11 years ago now. Uh, so why myopia management? Why did I get interested in this? Why should you be interested in doing this if you haven't already kind of taken the big leap here? Uh, and so for me, it was more of a, a financial decision and a practice management type of decision. So when I bought the practice in 2011, I saw what a stranglehold that vision plans really had on the old owner's business operations. And I kind of just decided right then and there that I wanted to do everything I possibly could in my power to reduce our independence on, on those vision plans. And so I started to kind of look around to see what the options were. Um, dry eye uh, centers of excellence were becoming a big thing at the time. Uh, I tried to dive into that. I quickly discovered how much I despise dry eye. Um, if you want my dry eye patients, I'm more happy to send them to you. Um, we're also having, we're having a number of issues of people paying out of pocket for these very expensive dry eye services that insurance wasn't covering. It just wasn't for me. Um, medical optometry, that was a big conversation around that at the time too, as there still is. I fully believe we should all be practicing to the full extent of our degrees. Uh, so I embraced that to its fullest. We build medically whenever appropriate. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're having a lot of issues getting on insurance panels and still to this day, not on any HMOs. Um, the reimbursements from medical insurances certainly are not keeping up with the rate of inflation. And now they're playing all these silly games. For instance, you may have to be on a certain vision plan panel in order just to get on certain insurance panels. And really it's just kind of a sinking ship. Um, still, we should, we are obviously still building medically, but I'm certainly not focused on growing that part of my practice. Um, specialty contact lenses really thought that there was some a great opportunity there. So I did a deep dive into scleral lenses, getting all the extra CE, going to the wet labs um, and being aggressive as I could with fitting new patients. Uh, but what I've kind of discovered with this is while, A, these are some of my most rewarding patients, unless you're really just in the right practice in the right place, it's tough to find 
a lot of really great patients that are candidates um, where the cost to benefit ratio for, you know, specialty lenses, uh, you know, makes sense. You know, at the end of the day, only about 0.2% of the population even has keratoconus. And in my 10 years of working with scleral lenses, I mean, I can, uh, I, I probably only have about maybe three or four dozen patients that I've managed to fit myself in, in scleral lenses for the, for the first time. So at the end of the day, it really doesn't, doesn't, make up a big part of my practice, even though I spent all this time and energy on it. Uh, orthokeratology was uh, kind of becoming a big thing 10 years ago or becoming a thing, I suppose. Um, and I kind of turned and looked at my practice. I saw that we had a pretty good percentage of pediatric patients coming through the practice. And I saw that well over half of those kids had myopia. And we now finding that there was something that we could do about it and finding out that it's, this was a fee for service type uh, type service that we could offer to them, um, I really thought that we kind of had something going here. It's all about opportunity. You know, we all know that myopia is getting worse. Um, it's in the rate of myopia in the United States and worldwide, you know, is increasing at an increasing rate. You know, in 1983, about the, the year I was born, um, the average onset of myopia was around 11 years old. And, and less than a generation later, 17 years later, the average onset of myopia was just eight years old. I mean, and these are the kids before, you know, they, they were born before iPhones and iPads and all of that. Um, so clearly an issue. But again, opportunity. There are 200, or I'm sorry, 278 children with myopia for every single eye care provider in the United States. So again, for everybody on this call right now, there is on average 278 children with myopia that are likely coming through your doors on an annual basis. If you're seeing patients five days a week and taking a few weeks of vacation every year, that means that on average, there's over one child with myopia coming through your practice every single day that you're, that you're in clinic. Uh, there's over 300,000 kids in the U.S. that are between the ages of 8 to 12 years old that are wearing single vision contact lenses. So over 300,000 kids that are wearing lenses that correct their vision, but simply aren't wearing a lens that is doing anything about the actual disease. It's not treating the actual disease of myopia. Um, you know, thankfully, a number of our colleagues and a number of the professional organizations that are within the world of optometry um, certainly have started to get it, if you will. Um, a number of the optometric organizations, you know, have start, started to kind of announce or declare their unanimous support for, you know, making myopia management their standard of care. We, a number of years ago in our practice, decided to make our standard of care. And I implore you to certainly uh, consider making myopia management your standard of care in your practice. Uh, so one size certainly does not fit all in a myopia management practice. So we'll just take a brief moment to kind of review the other modalities uh, that, that we know are clinically proven to slow down the progression of myopia. So first bifocal or progressive addition glasses. Uh, so used as a monotherapy, uh, we do know that bifocals and progressives can slow down how fast myopia is progressing, but it's not at a clinically significant rate with very few exceptions. So in our practice, no, we do not use bifocals or progressive glasses as a monotherapy of treating myopia. Dual focus contact lenses, that's gonna be the meat of our presentation today. So we'll do a deep dive into that here in just a minute. Uh, orthokeratology, orthokay, that's great. That's how I got my start doing myopia management. Um, it's been around for more than a couple of decades now at this point. Uh, patients, um, a number of patients are starting to be familiar with this technology and actually come in asking for it now. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, fitting an orthokay lens, while it's not rocket science, um, it is a little bit more complex than fitting any kind of soft contact lens in most situations. You do have to have advanced equipment like a corneal topographer, um, and then you will have to deal with things like broken lenses, crack chip lenses, or lost lenses, a little bit more difficult to replace, you know, a custom-made product for a patient. And even though we do know that Ortho-K, as long as all the, uh, the protocols and directions are being followed and cleaning, cleaning protocols, we know that it's very, very safe for children, but any daytime contact lens, soft contact lens modality, specifically a daily disposable soft contact lens modality is always going to have a little bit better of a safety profile versus any overnight wearing lens. And then certainly last but not least, pharmaceuticals, uh, compounded atropine. Uh, we certainly know we'll have a clinically significant effect at the right concentrations. Um, the biggest issues I have with atropine 
are A, it's a drug. I'm not a big fan of putting a drug into a child's system, if you will, uh, unless I really need to. But the, the bigger issue is kind of the side effects for me. You know, uh, there's definitely an increase with light sensitivity, photophobia, with atropine. All of our kids that are on atropine therapy are either wearing sunglasses on a regular basis or have photochromic uh, light reactive lenses. Uh, but me personally, I'm, I'm almost a little more concerned about the effect on the accommodative system. I mean, these are all very young school age children, um, kind of in the prime of the learning part of their, their lives. You know, kids make very poor historians when you're asking them, you know, such subjective questions about their reading and seeing letters up close and whatnot. So, you know, I'm personally a little concerned about what effect we're having on that accommodative system and uh, what effect that may be having on their, you know, their ability to learn and whatnot. So in our practice, we utilize atropine uh, for our really young children that simply just aren't at the age where um, the parents are either willing to do ortho K or a soft contact lens. Um, um, oh, and, and we do utilize low dose atropine for some combination uh, therapies where, where it is appropriate. Just a very brief update on atropine because there's been a lot uh, going on here in, in the world of atropine the last just month here. Uh, so uh, just last month in June, uh, Viluma Pharmaceutical Company did receive FDA approval for their 0.01% concentration uh, form, formula. Uh, it is not available yet on the, in, in the U.S. market. I, um, it's, it's rumored that they're going for some sort of fall release date, so we very likely will have access to this very, very soon. But in the actual trial that the FDA approval is based on, their 0.02%, so their, their compound that had twice the amount of atropine in it, did not have as good efficacy as the 0.01%. And that really doesn't make a lot of sense uh, when we kind of compare that to a, a number of the other atropine studies that we look at, when we compare this to the Adam studies and also to the LAMP study, um, you know, those studies showed with increasing levels or concentrations of atropine, we certainly had better control. So that's, you know, there's a couple questions that I kind of have that need to be answered there. Um, and then just this last week, uh, there is this group called the PEDIG uh, or the Pediatric Eye Disease Investigator Group, which is based here in the United States. This is funded by the National Institute of Health. So Usually NIH uh, studies are very, very good. Uh, they use a US population. And so most of the atropine studies that are out there are Asian populations, uh, but this is the first time, I, I believe it's one of the first times we've had a, a, a study of this size uh, with atropine of the US population. And what they found and published is that 0.01% atropine was no better versus a placebo um, or drop with basically nothing in it. Uh, so uh, clearly there are more answers um, that we uh, need to have here. And there are more questions we need to ask about, uh, uh, about atropine before we have this widespread adoption of it. Uh, so here's a question that I get in various forms with almost every time I do this presentation. So this is more of a cultural question. I was kind of surprised, impressed that you had such a high myopic control demand in a predominantly non-Asian population. Do you approach the talk differently? I feel like it is always such an easier talk with Asian parents versus non-Asian parents. So a little background, our practice uh, in North Chicagoland is approximately, the population is around 14% Asian. Um, our practice demographics um, are about the same as that as well too. Uh, and what I did notice after doing ortho K for a number of years, probably after six or seven years, um, is even though our practice was maybe only 10 to 15% Asian, our ortho K patient population was well over 50%. Um, and I think there's a couple of different reasons for that. Uh, reason number one, um, Asian, I, I find, at least it's been my experience that uh, most of our Asian families are more likely to recognize that myopia is a problem and that there is something that you can actually do about it. Uh, and number two, I think there, it comes down to familiarity. Um, if, if uh, an Asian family is much more likely to be familiar with the concept of orthokeratology or CRT or whatever you want to call it, corneal reshaping, uh, and they're much more likely to know somebody that has already been in treatment, whether it's a family member, a distant relative, or just a, just a friend. Um, when I'm in the exam lane and I'm talking about introducing a, a medical device that treats myopia, I'm much more likely to get a yes um, or I'm much more likely to get that child into treatment if the family is already familiar uh, with that medical device. I mean, even to this day, if I'm ever presenting orthokeratology to someone, doesn't matter what their ethnicity or background is, it's never heard of ortho-K, I'll say, hey, did you know we've got this great lens? 
Your child can sleep in it at nighttime. They take it out in the morning. And guess what? They do not need to have any glasses or contact lenses at the daytime. They can see perfectly. I mean, they kind of look at me like I'm halfway crazy. They're like, what? Like, what are you talking about? Um, now, any of our parents now these days coming through our practices, I think you'd be hard pressed to find one that is not familiar with the concept of a disposable soft contact lens. Um, and today, and at least in our practice, it's rare that I would probably come across a parent that wasn't even at least familiar with the concept of a daily disposable contact lens. So, you know, if I'm having a conversation saying, hey, little Johnny, I'm going to put him into this soft contact lens, very similar to the, what you wear yourself. But this contact lens has the added benefit that it's actually going to slow down how fast your child's eyes are changing. So that's really been a big game changer for us and has really increased our capture rate for kids just getting into myopia management in general. I think it's important just to review uh, soft contact lens safety in children. Um, a number of our uh, uh, colleagues uh, uh, erroneously believe um, or choose to not fit younger kids in contact lenses, believing that contact lenses simply aren't that safe for younger children, but the data the proof is in the data here. Uh, this is a study published, I think, in 2017 by Mark Bollemore, uh, looking at contact lens safety in children. And what we see is basically the younger the child, the eight to 12 year old group, uh, tends to have less um, incidences of negative contact lens related events like microbial keratitis, Claire, infiltrative keratitis, so on and so forth, than any other age. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the primary reason though is going to be as the younger the child is, there's going to be more parental oversight. So those kids are more likely to be following the replacement protocols. Um, they're gonna be doing a better job of cleaning the lenses if that's apl applicable. Um, they're not gonna be sleeping in the lenses, so on and so forth. Um, you know, If you look at this little chart here, you can clearly see it's those young adults, the college to grad school slash first job in the real world uh, type patients that uh, where these incidences of negative contact lens events really spike. And these are, you know, these are the kids that aren't replacing the lenses. They're falling asleep after having a couple of beers at nighttime or whatever. So again, that is uh, the contact lens safety, very, very safe for children uh, that are young. Uh, Dr. Bull or Mark Bullimore did update his, uh, his data just this early in early 2013 here. And what he concluded is that the incidence of microbial keratitis in children is certainly no higher than in adults. Um, in fact, there were approximately 4.8 cases for 10,000 patient years. You know, in real speak, that means it almost never happens. Uh, and he also found that the incidence of corneal infiltrative events seems to be markedly lower in children versus adults. So efficacy. So let's talk about how well soft contact lenses can work for slowing down how fast myopia is progressing. So we're gonna focus on distance centered multifocal lenses kind of as a whole here. Um, the MySight lens is not included in this data set that we're looking at here. So this is a meta-analysis looked at a number of studies that looked at concentric ring bifocal and peripheral ad multifocal contact lenses um, and how much they slowed myopia. And what the authors um, found is that on average, we're gonna see approximately 31 to 51% less, less axial length elongation over the course of two years. So the number I really just kind of want you to remember is on average, we expect to see about 40% reduction in the axial length elongation and also the progression of myopia with a child in a distance centered contact lens. So which contact lenses can you use? They have to be distance centered multifocal contact lenses or center D designs. Uh, the majority of, soft, of contact lenses, specifically the dailies, the new multifocals that have come out in the last few years, they are almost all center near design. So you, need, you would be doing your patients a disservice if you were prescribing a near centered multifocal contact lens because there are no near centered multifocal lenses that have been proven to slow down myopia. You're just selling those, those families an overpriced lens that really is just doing nothing but correcting their vision. So to make sure they are decentered lenses, and we're going to review uh, the ones that are available in the U.S. here in a few moments. So just to review what a decentered lens is, so the very center of the contact lens has the distance-centered optics when you're looking straight ahead, and the power profile of the lens as you start moving towards the periphery adds more and more plus or the add power. That's what creates the peripheral defocus, and peripheral defocus is of course what uh, is what we believe to slow down how fast. Uh, the myopia is progressing and also slow down the axial, ultimately slow down that axial length growth. Um, the Blink study that was done a few years back led by Jeff, Jeff Walling 
uh, look to see which ad powers might be the more effective of, of when you're selecting a multifocal lens. So the Biofinity multifocal uh, lens is a great lens uh, that was used in this study. We utilize the Biofinity multifocal toric lens very regularly for our, for our, our myopia management practice. Um, we find that the spherical um, spherical distance centered multifocals in the mysite lens uh, can mask cylinder, corneal cylinder and refractive cylinder up to approximately 0.75 to one diopters, give or take. Uh, once you get to 1.25 diopters up to about 250, um, our go-to is the Biofinity multifocal toric lens design. Um, and so as far as ad powers are concerned, uh, the Blink study looked at a single vision lens versus a 150 ad power lens versus a plus 250 ad power lens. And what we found is that the higher the ad power, the more effective the lens was. And so uh, what does that mean? That means if you are choosing a distance centered multifocal lens to uh, slow down myopia, you want to use the highest ad power available. In the Biofinity family of, of, of multifocals, that would be the plus 250 lens. You're always going to grab the D-centered lenses. If you're familiar with the Biofinity multifocals, you know, there's the D-centered lenses and the N-centered lenses. You will never, ever touch the N-centered lenses. I know we're programmed with early emerging presbyopes, you know, to use the lower ad powers first and kind of work them into it. Kids' visual systems are wildly different than presbyopes and emerging presbyopes. We, we simply do not see the adaptation and the issues we see with presbyopes when we, when we fit a high ad power contact lens onto, onto a pediatric eye. So again, always use the highest ad power available. Natural view one day multifocal. So this, uh, this is a lens made by a company called Visioneering Technologies, VTI. Um, uh, not one of the major four contact lens manufacturers in the US, but this lens is available nationwide. I believe everybody can get a fit set if they, if they wish. Um, so again, a one day throwaway multifocal distance centered lens. Uh, what I really like about this lens is its uh, extended per range of parameters. So the MySight lens uh, does top out at minus seven diopters. Um, but for those patients that we start in, say, MySight, not at minus 650 or minus seven, we know they're going to continue to progress. Um, if they kind of outgrow MySight, it's very easy to transition them into this lens. Um, or we do have a handful of cases um, where we have started myopia management that, where the kids are already past the minus seven. And if it's a nearly spherical refraction, this is certainly my go-to lens design. Uh, VTI does have this lens in a uh, clinical, clinical trial that is currently ongoing. Um, we believe that their intention is to get this lens, you know, FDA approved for the treatment of myopia. Um, one of our uh, AEG sister locations that's right up the street from us um, is engaged in this clinical trial. And I do understand things are going pretty well. And so I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple short years that we have access to yet another lens. Uh, so what happens when the cylinder, you know, gets above minus 225, minus 250? Um, that's when I think it's time to start considering the more specialty lens products. Now, thankfully, these patients are, you know, few and far in between. Um, out of the hundreds of patients that we currently have uh, in myopia management, I can probably count on two hands uh, how many of those patients we have in these specialty type lenses. But Synergize is definitely a good option for pediatric patients, basically a gas permeable lens with a soft lens skirt to make it a lot more comfortable. Um, certainly can very wide range of parameters available, especially if the cylinders all in the cornea, relatively easy to fit. Uh, these lenses are definitely did more difficult to handle for a pediatric patient. Um, if you were going to be uh, utilizing these lenses, you know, get on the phone with their consultation, let them know that this is for a pediatric eye. Um, if you've got the HVID, even better, you can let them know how big the eye is. And I find that the flatter lens skirts designs tend to work a little bit better with these, uh, with these really little eyes. Um, and then certainly uh, you theoretically could use any distance centered custom lens design to do this as long as it's distance centered optics with a high ad power. Uh, you theoretically could use a progressive base gas permeable contact lenses. You could certainly even use a, a distance centered scleral contact lens. I have never done that myself, but for whatever the, the patient presents and, and you're comfortable doing that, that certainly would, would work. Uh, and there's a number of laboratories that can make these types of lenses available. Uh, there's also custom soft contact lenses that can be made, but with the wide range of 
uh, parameters that are available with lenses like biofinity multifocal toric. You know, I've never had to reach, uh, I've never had to reach or order any of those types of lenses, but they certainly are out there. Um, our go-to lab is Metro Optics. Uh, ABB has a number of lens designs available, so does Bosch and Lom, and also specialized custom contact lenses. Um, so it's worth mentioning uh, the active ability one day soft therapeutic lens for myopia management, and not to be confused with the Acuvue Ability orthokeratology lens that is currently available in the U.S. Uh, so this is a daily disposable lens, similar concept to uh, my site, if you will. Um, it is not yet available in the U.S., so this has not been FDA approved. You cannot get it here yet, but with the uh, powerhouse that Johnson & Johnson Vision is, um, I would be shocked if they were not actively attempting to get some sort of FDA approval. So I would, again, would not be surprised if we uh, get this other, an additional tool for our toolbox of, uh, you know, correcting, uh, correcting patients' eyes with soft contacts in the next, next couple of years. Um, last, but certainly not least of the soft contact lenses are the MySight One Day Myopia Control Contact Lenses. And, and for me, this is what really kind of open the floodgates for myopia management. You know, in the few, in the, in the first year uh, since my site launched in the US, the number of kids that we had in myopia management period, I mean, more than doubled in just one year's time. And really, I think it kind of came down to that, that FDA approval. The fact that we now have a medical device available in the United States that is clinically proven and FDA approved to slow down how fast myopia is changing really just helps. Uh, I, I really think just makes uh, just provided a lot more credibility to myopia management in the first place. Um, basically, um, you've got the FDA saying, hey, here is a treatment that actually works. Um, and we've got more people talking about myopia management, the number of kids that we actually have in orthokeratology and atropine and other soft contact lenses for myopia control actually went up. So it almost had a synergistic effect uh, with our uh, with our other treatment modalities. So the the MySight one day seven year clinical trial is the longest uh, soft contact lens study for myopia management uh, that's that's in existence. Very 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 cool trial. So I'll kind of walk you through how they did this. Uh, so it was three stages. Uh, part part one, the first three years of the trial, there were uh, how, all the kids were between the ages of eight to twelve years old. Half the kids were put into the MySight lens. Half the kids were put into the ProClear one day lens uh, in the control group. Just to correct their distance vision. At the end of the first three years, uh, the researchers saw that, that there was a dramatic difference between the two groups in axial length. The kids um, in, the, in the myopia or in the mysite group, uh, their axial length had changed by less than half of the kids in the control group. So they couldn't justify keeping all those kids in the control group anymore. So years four through six, we refit all the kids in the control group into mysite. So all of the kids now in the trial were in mysite for the years four through six. And then finally in year seven, all the kids were now between the ages of 14 to 18 years old. And so we essentially kind of washed them out of my site. We refit them all back into uh, single vision distance only pro clear one day, basically to look to see if there was any clinically significant rebound effect. Uh, the, the results pretty awesome. Uh, we saw on average, there was a 59% reduction of the progression of myopia and a 52% reduction of axial length on average. Um, the, again, I like to keep my numbers kind of simple. The only thing I really want you to remember is that there was a greater than 50% reduction in myopia and axial length on average. So when you're talking to a parent about this, you can say, we expect to see on average greater than 50% reduction in how fast your kid's eyes are changing. Uh, here's the data kind of graphed out here. So study time is in months on the x-axis on time on the bottom. And then we've got our change in axial length on the y-axis going up is bad. The higher we go, the more axial length growth we have. Uh, the bottom line, so in part one, it's the first three years of the trial. Our treatment group is the line on the bottom. And the top line is our kids that are in the control group. And you can see at the end of the first three years that the kids in the mysite group had less than half the progression of axial length than the kids in the control group. Now, this is where the study really, really gets interesting. So in part two, we refit all the kids in the control group into the mysite lens. And you can actually see that inflection point on the chart right there where the slope of the change in axial length over time is almost identical to the kids that were in the mysite lens the entire time. And I think that right there is kind of the biggest testament to how well 
this lens actually works and the proof that this lens actually works and does what it says it's advertised to do. Uh, and then certainly last but not least, our last, our final year of treatment, year number seven, we took all the kids out of my site, put them into Proclear one day. And thankfully, no, we did not see any clinically significant rebound effect. Uh, it's just to repackage that data in a different way. Uh, here we have study time and months again on the x-axis, change in axial length on the y-axis here. The bottom line are the kids that were in the MySight lens for the full six years. So the top line are the kids that were in the control group. Now, if at the end of six years, the kids that were in the MySight group, their total axial length change was almost identical to the first two years of kids that were in the control group. To say that a different way, the kids wearing the MySight lens basically erased four whole years of myopic progression. That's, that's pretty, pretty amazing data right there. And then again, I'll, I'll, as a practitioner, I really think that this FDA approval was really kind of a big game changer here. Um, as a parent myself, you know, it would be, I would be very hard pressed to consider putting my child on any kind of medication or a medical device, certainly a medical device for an extended period of time, you know, that did not have FDA approval. You know, to me as a parent, the FDA approval uh, says a couple of different things. It says not, it says, first of all, it says the science is going to be rock solid. In order to get FDA approval, you have to have rock solid clinical trials, rock solid science behind them. Uh, and, but almost equally as important, um, you've got this governing body that has, uh, told us or that lets, us, lets me as a parent know that this treatment plan is safe for my child to use. Uh, the International Myopia Institute um, you know, recently published these industry guidelines and ethical considerations for myopia control. Uh, this kind of is basically the algorithm that I kind of think through when I'm trying to kind of select a treatment modality for any of my kids uh, that are going to be going into myopia management. So first of all, we identified there's a patient that has progressing myopia. I then asked myself, are there FDA approved options available? So does this child meet the actual FDA indications? As of right now, the only FDA product available before we get this atropine in a few months uh, is my site. Uh, and so if the answer to that question is yes, I will go ahead and I will prescribe my site. If the answer is no, then I need to ask myself two questions. Uh, does the off-label treatment have a known clinically significant treatment efficacy in a randomized controlled trial study design? Um, we can't be just making this stuff. We need to be prescribing what the science has told us. Um, and also, has the pa patient's parent been informed and agreed to that off-label treatment? If the answer to both of those questions are yes and uh, in, in my situation, that's almost always the case, then yes, I will go ahead and uh, uh, start that child in some sort of off-label myopia management treatment plan, whether it's a distance-centered soft lens, ortho K or atropine. Uh, but if the answer to, those, to either of those questions is no, then we need to kind of take a step back and reevaluate our question, uh, reevaluate re 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 our options. Ghosting. Uh, so perhaps the number one question I get from doctors that are a little bit hesitant to start fitting multifocal lens on kids or even the mysite lens uh, is this ghosting phenomenon that we know is present. So in a lot, a number of the clinical trials and also in my own experience, we find that approximately half of kids, when you first put these lenses on their eyes, will experience a little bit of ghosting. So I always do my best to elicit that ghosting and complaint while the patient is in the exam lens. So when they first put the lenses on, we'll have them read the acuity chart. Almost always they're going to get down to the 2020 line, but then I'll ask them, do you see little shadows or halos, or do you see like a little bit of a reflection around the screen? Uh, and again, half the time, the answer is going to be yes. And I'll say, good. That's how we know that the lens is working. Again, we know that this works by peripheral defocus. So the child is seeing a little bit of a side effect from that. And I'll say to the child and make sure the parent is in the room and hearing me as well, too, that will go away or that will likely go away and it will definitely improve over the course of the next week. And uh, when that one week follow up, sure enough, 99% of the time, um, the ghosting effects have completely gone and the child has no vision complaints whatsoever. Um, long term, again, out of the hundreds of patients I have in various myopia management modalities, I can count on one hand um, how many uh, still have some sort of halo or starburst or kind of ghosting effect after they've been wearing the lenses for more than a couple of months. Um, and it typically, it never ever becomes an issue. Um, until those those patients are at least 16 years old and, you know, driving and driving at night. 
Um, so next question, or the primary question I get then from a parent uh, when we're talking about this or doing our consultations, is, well, wait a minute, what makes this contact lens any different than the contact lenses that I'm wearing right now? How, do, how does this actually work? So I'll get out my eye, little eye model from 1975, the old owner had sitting around, and I'll say, um, so here is an eye, an eye that doesn't require any glasses or contact lenses. The light comes into the eye and it focuses perfectly on the retina. Now, your child has myopia. Myopia is a disease where the eye has physically grown longer. And without corrective lenses, the light is focused all the way up here in front of the eye and everything is blurry to your child. A conventional contact lens takes that light and it focuses all of the light on the retina all the way around. Now, what this lens that I'm fitting your child in today is going to do, it's going to keep that light center on the, the center and the middle, middle peripheral retina. It's going to keep the light focused right there. This is the part of the retina that you're looking at with me right now. It's what your child uses to see the board at school, to read schoolwork on their iPad or their tablet. Uh, when they're 16 years old, it's what they use to drive. It's going to keep their vision clear. And we're perfectly going to focus the light in front of the peripheral retina. And by doing that, the retina almost wants to hug that light and it keeps the eye from growing longer. Now, out of the hundreds of times I've done this consultation, I have never had an engineer or a physician or anyone um, have me go dive any further than that relatively simple explanation. Obviously, there's a little bit more going on than that there. Um, but again, um, I don't find that we need to be getting that technical in the exam line. Uh, kind of a pro tip here, you know, be the doctor prescribe, don't recommend. When you've got a patient coming into your practice and they've got a disease like myopia and you know there's something you can do about it and you honestly feel that it's in that patient's best interest, don't be giving them the option of starting myopia management. Go ahead and just be the doctor, do what you've been educated to do and prescribe what's best for that patient. This is one of the places where I think soft contact lenses has really made our job a lot easier for myopia management. You know, most soft contact lenses come in a trial set, the VTI lenses, the MySight lenses, Biofinity Multifocal. We've got the lenses already in our practice. So here's an example. Let's say you've got little Johnny, 10 years old, coming in for a brand new contact lens fitting. Uh, he plays a lot of baseball, a lot of sports. Um, parents are very interested in getting him in the context, but have never heard of myopia management, my site, myopia control, or anything like that. Um, I will go ahead and just put that child into whatever appropriate myopia control lens um, I think is best for him. And uh, then I will briefly just spend a minute or two educating the parents, say, hey, look, I'm putting little Johnny into this soft disposable lens, very similar to what it is that you're wearing right now, and that's going to correct his vision but this lens is going to also slow down how fast his eyes are changing by about 50%. I'm gonna send you home with some of these materials. I want you to uh, read a little bit more about this concept or this treatment plan called myopia management. I want you to come back next week with your spouse and I want you to come with, armed with the questions that you have about what it is that we are trying to accomplish here. I found that every single time that I do this, um, that has uh, the parent has gone home and they have uh, done a little bit of Googling or whatever, and there's so much stuff out there on the internet now about this stuff. Uh, and we have always successfully uh, transitioned those, those kids uh, into, into treatment. So it really has made it, really has made it so much easier for us. Um, rewarding. Uh, so, you know, I got into this for basically financial purposes, uh, but what kind of surprised me over the last 10 years is how actually rewarding and good it is to see these patients coming in on a regular basis. You know, what used to be my favorite patients were the keratoconic patients that you fit in the lens and they haven't seen better than 20, 70 in 15 years or whatever, and then they hug you. Hey, these patients want to hug you as well too. I mean, you really do get to know these families over time. We follow up with all of them you know, at six month intervals at a minimum. And so we're seeing these patients a lot more than we see our other, our other patients. Um, and ge generally speaking, these are otherwise healthy, pleasant patients to be seeing. Young patients, I think are always fun to see. Uh, but the, the patients themselves, when they see the lack of progression or the fact that their eyes are sometimes not changing at all or barely changing, that makes for a very, very happy patient. It makes for a very, very happy parent. And it makes for a very happy eye doctor as well too. So absolutely wonderful. Uh, but profitability, you know, my the original goal or reason I kind of got into this, yes, it does accomplish that as well, too. We have found myopia management to be very, 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 very profitable. Um, early on in the ortho K days, we did um, 
drop all of the bottom feeding vision plans and it had zero effect or only had positive effects uh, on our on our practice even when our schedule wasn't even full yet uh and then uh in uh, 2019, in early 2019, I took the dive of uh, dropping IMED, which represented 34% of all the patients, over a third of the patients coming in our doors uh, were IMED. Our full-time associate doctor wasn't even, didn't even have a full schedule yet. Um, and I was very, very nervous about this, uh, but the follow, and, and if you know much about the Chicagoland market, almost every practice takes almost every vision plan. Um, very, very saturated market with uh, the two optometry schools there. Uh, but um, we, the following month uh, was our best month of all time, not only from a gross revenue standpoint, but also from a net revenue standpoint. And we never looked back every month after month after month, the practice has only just continued to grow. Um, when it gets down to the numbers, we find that one myopia management patient is worth the net profitability of 10 VSP patients. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather see three myopia management patients per day than 30 VSP patients, you know, any, any given day of the week. Uh, one thing that patients are always, or other colleagues are always kind of surprised to hear is that, that our practice is not a pediatric focused practice. We are a run of the mill, um, primary eye care, see all ages type practice. I see almost as many patients that are on Medicare as I do pediatric patients. Uh, only about 8%, less than one in 10 of my patients are in myopia management but it does represent uh, over a quarter of the revenue of the practice. So really, really big money maker here. Um, if we wanted to stop seeing, uh, you know, if we wanted to just all of a sudden stop seeing all primary care and just do myopia management, you know, we'd be doing over a half a million dollars a year and I'd be seeing what 20 patients a week and we'd still be able to make, still be able to make things work. So it's, it, you can do it. Um, fee structure wise. So when you're determining your fees, uh, the most, the biggest misstep I see so many doctors take is, is they just make things too complicated. I really try to keep things as simple as possible. I'm a big fan of the KISS acronym whenever we're trying to change some protocol in the practice. K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. Just try to keep it as simple as you possibly can. We are so brainwashed by our vision plans, especially at making things so complex. I mean, I mean, with VSP, wholesale frame allowance, uh, charging extra for retinal photo screening, different levels of contact lens fitting on some plans, VSP plans, patients pay this, but here they get 20% off here. They just pay $85 or whatever. Um, I mean, it's just terrible. Um, it's confusing for the staff. It's confusing for the patient. I never understood it, even when I was a practice owner. Um, so we just really just try to keep it straightforward. If I can't explain it, uh, how the pricing and the structure to a patient in one minute, there's no way that your staff's going to be able to clearly explain it either. Uh, so that's where the informed consent agreement comes in. Um, informed consent agreements are serves multiple purposes. Uh, first, we're going to obviously have very clear and transparent pricing in there. We choose to charge the same amount for all patients in myopia management. It doesn't matter if they're atropine, mycite, biofinity, VTI. Um, whatever, we just charge the same amount. Um, we've got the refund policies, all those kind of things outlined in, in our informed consent agreement. Uh, our our, our um, ICs also function as a list of frequently asked questions. They were more or less living documents for a number of years where every month we'd kind of go back and revisit them and kind of add little things in as they kind of came up within the practice. Um, to now, uh, now it's about about two and a half pages long. Um, and uh, we have our staff members read these informed consents probably every three or four months just to kind of refresh their memories. And the answers to about 95% of the questions that patients have, either new patients or current patients have about our myopia management program are in there. So our staff are able to answer the vast majority of these questions when patients call or email in. And on the 5% of time when they're not and they're not quite sure what the answer is, or a patient's asking something a little more technical, they'll just say, hey, let me just take down your name and number, and one of our doctors will get back to you within the next day or two. So it really has been a big time saver for, for me as well, not having to, to discuss all these details with patients. Uh, so another secret to our success is our automatic payment platform. So uh, let's say you are charging, I'm going to make up a number here, uh, $1,800 a year for myopia management. You're packaging everything into one kind of flat payment that includes everything. It includes all the lenses, the visits, the follow-ups, patients have any problems in the meantime, everything's just included. Uh, now, let's say you say, no, the cost is $150 per month. 
$150 per month and $1,800 a year are the same number. That's the same amount of revenue coming into your practice. Most patients, adults can't do that math or won't do that math uh, simply on the fly. Um, and so our staff is trained to not ever talk about what our annual costs are. They are simply trained to talk about the flat recurring monthly payment. Um, this is also this really has lowered the barrier of entry to myopia management. Um, we used to have a, you know, we used to make patients commit to a minimum of six months. We stopped even doing that because uh, it's very rare that we have a child that starts in one of our programs that ever drops out, specifically that ever drops out in the first few months. So really has made us be have to be a lot less aggressive with trying to sell this. You know, a program almost kind of sells itself at this point. Uh, there are a number of different ways you can run these automatic payments. Uh, we've always used Chase Merchant Services or Chase Bank with our credit card terminals. Um, I just one day picked up the, the last statement, called the phone number on the statement, tried to explain what I wanted to do. I never even got transferred to anyone else. Within five minutes, the rep that answers like, oh, yeah, we well, could use our orbital gateway and literally got me set up. And within five minutes, I had a login to this web portal. We can just go in. We can we can create a serial number for each patient. They can match the chart number in our EHR. Um, and we just put down, we put in their credit card information, name, address, email for sending automatic receipts if you want to enable that. And what day of the month they're going to be charged, the amount and how many payments, or if it's just going to kind of keep going on in perpetuity. Uh, there are a number of other payment processors out there that'll do this. Square has a pretty uh, straightforward platform that I've vetted. So does PayPal. And there's also a company called PaySimple. Uh, but chances are, if you're using a major bank um, or major credit card processing company, that there's already a solution built into whatever it is that you're using. Just have to get on the phone, call them, tell them what you want to do, and they can certainly get something set up. Um, took us about a year or so to kind of work out the glitches here, if you will. Um, but um, at the end of the day, it's certainly not rocket science. And we have all we have this automatic revenue coming into the practice. Like, for example, over COVID, when we shut down, we were having tens of thousands of dollars of revenue that were still coming in. We weren't even the practice wasn't even open. So it really just makes things quite easy. Uh, so here's a question that I get quite often. Uh, do you have the same or different fees for ortho K, my site? and atropine? And yeah, it comes back to that. Keep it simple, stupid. Yes, absolutely. We have we charge the same fee. Uh, for all treatment modalities. We used to have different tiers. We have found that that got really complex. We did grandfather a lot of those old patients in, and that still makes things a headache for our staff. And so, but any patients the last couple of years going forward, we kept at the same tier. This really just made our lives um, a lot easier. Also makes it very easy to pivot treatments. Let's say you've got a child, you started in atropine, and now they've gotten a year older, and now they're ready for contact lenses. You'd rather have them in FDA-approved mycite anyways. You can just simply transition them over without having to make them sign new contracts, so on and so forth. We've got a kid in my site where they had a little bit of cylinder, and after a year or two, all of a sudden their stigmatism is suddenly just taken off. Um, you can just transition them over to Biofinity Multifocal Toric, and you kind of keep rocking and rolling. No changes in the fees, flat monthly payment keeps going. You don't even have to have the money discussion, which is, which is great. Uh, what do you say to parents that push back on prices? And uh, what I would say now is since we implemented this monthly flat payment program, they simply don't. Um, we just talk about that flat monthly payment. Um, we say it's very, it's like, hey, would, this is for the cost of your family cell phone bill. We can get your child into treatment starting today. And that usually does the trick. What do you find to be more effective? Cons consulting the same day as the routine exam? or bringing them back. Uh, we used to bring them back and I used to have this whole long winded thing where I talk about myopia and show charts and graphs and plug their axial length data into, into calculators and, and whatnot. And really I, I found that this kind of overwhelmed the patients. We also had a lot of issues with no-shows and people just rescheduling or just canceling those follow-ups. So what we found is that you really wanna get that consultation in during that routine exam. The consult really only needs to be about two to three minutes. You need to just keep practicing and working on your little elevator speech um, because if you let that patient walk out the door and they haven't committed um, to starting one of the programs or to seriously consider doing it, the chances of them starting uh, go down exponentially once they walk out that front door. Uh, so what has been your best form of marketing aside from word of mouth? Uh, so uh, the most, uh, for the first 10 years, uh, almost all of our myopia management patients came from internally. 
And they were just the kids coming in for their annual checkups, for their annual exams. We were always looking back in the charts at family members to see if there's other high myopia in the family, specifically the parents, or if there's any older siblings. So a lot of times we were already kind of prepared to know if this patient was likely going to be a myopia uh, management consultation. Now, there's a reason why these patients keep coming back to see you, the established patients year after year after year, they've developed a rapport with you, they trust you or they trust the brand, they trust your practice. And so they're going, these established patients are going to listen to what you say. Um, I find that it's kind of a waste of time and money um, to start marketing yourself as the myopia management person until you at least have at least a couple dozen or more patients under your belt. But a couple dozen or so, that's the point where you'll probably develop the, com the confidence where you can start talking to this to your colleagues, um, introduce yourself to other practitioners area that may not be doing this, and then you can start generating external referrals. But again, it took us almost 10 years um, to get to that point. Uh, Important to have marketing materials around in your practice. Uh, you know, certainly my site has brochures and materials that you can get available that you can hand to your patients. Uh, all the ortho -K companies have stuff as well. We've taken a lot of these brochures and stolen the verbiage from, uh, from them and created our own brochures. Um, I do some consulting uh, for a number of different practices, and we've actually started using artificial intelligence to write and form consent agreements and uh, some marketing materials. And it is scary at, uh, the fact that these AI generators are writing better uh, marketing materials than I have spent many, many hours and hours upon. Uh, but um, I'm now kind of getting around to kind of re-updating our stuff. Uh, this is our director of marketing, Leo, and our office dog. He just insists on making a special guest appearance in all of our presentations, all of my presentations. Uh, this is our myopia management room. Um, if you are a patient at our practice and you're walking through, um, you will very clearly see the myopia management bra branding. And it's, it's clear to see that we are serious about myopia management. And a lot of times we'll get patients that, um, that um, are, don't even have kids or um, your kids are already grown or whatever, and they'll start asking us, hey, what is this? What is this all about? And uh, we just will start talking to them and that gets out in the community and just generates even more referrals. Uh, if you're really interested in um, you know, diving more into myopia management, a couple of simple things you can do. Um, I'm a big fan of the review of myopia management email blast. You can simply just get on there, sign up, and get a weekly email uh, with summaries of what's new. Uh, new devices coming out, new clinical trials, some early results, uh, status of atropine, so on and so forth. Uh, the Vision by Design meeting is happening in September. It's actually happening in the Chicagoland area. That's where I got my start doing orthokeratology. So it's all things orthoke and myopia control. Um, very uh, definitely worthwhile checking out. I think they do have a virtual option this year as well, too. Um, I do offer um, myopia management consulting. I've done uh, uh, I've done single location practices to very large practices, city locations, rural locations, whatever. If you want to hear a little bit more about the services, definitely feel free to shoot me an email or if you just have any other questions in general. And so that, with that, I implore you to move from just correcting myopia to treating myopia.